Okay, everybody knows <laughs> for the second time <laughs> that uh, feathered wear is the enemy. All right, everybody agree? Uh, and that's what we're trying to defeat. And this is where we got into alignment in the first place. This is what we're, we're hoping to solve for everybody is feathered wear. It, it causes a significant amount of tire loss. Uh, it's, it's enough that uh, it, it, you're losing one uh, right tire for every, and for every two left tires, depending on how your vehicle is aligned. Okay. If you get everything aligned properly, you can have, the, have tires last upwards of two to 300,000 miles, depending on how your truck's set up. <clears throat> so feathered wear was the problem. And obviously the easiest way to identify it is run your hand laterally across a tire to see whether or not you can feel that sharp edge that you see on the left side of the screen. <clears throat> and as you know, toe in wear is smooth in towards the frame and, and sharp out away from the frame. Toe out wear is smooth out from the frame and sharp in towards the frame. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the reason that we were having this problem back in the 70s and 80s, even into the 90s of having a toe out uh, wear pattern, even though we had measured the vehicle being towed in was because of a uh, <clears throat> an issue with steering components. Specifically, we're going to go with the tie rod end here, uh, but that's not the only one. As you can see, the, a good tie rod end has a certain amount of allowable uh, play, uh, as much as two and a, uh, a half millimeters of uh, vertical and lateral movement. But most important is here the uh, the, the vertical and uh, in and out movement, but the, the most important is the lateral movement, side to side movement, because that determines how long the actual tie rod is. And what uh, the, the truth is that a good tie rod end can have as much as a millimeter of play in the tie rod end and still be considered uh, perfectly good and new. So if a good tie rod end can have one millimeter of play, how much the bad tie rod ends have? Another good question. We'll, we'll have to find out as we look at them, but nobody really measures them. We'll just uh, take them out, throw them away, get a new one. So again, we, we have to start with the, uh, the, the issue that a good tie rod end has as much as a millimeter of possible play. Now, how does that result in toe? Well, start here. If you have a millimeter of end play there in the steering arm that is seven inches away from the spindle, then you have as much as a, over, a, over the 42 inch diameter of a tire, which is the actual toe measurement of a tire, you have as much as a quarter of an inch of possible toe change just from one millimeter of, toe, of a tie rod end play. And you got two tie rod ends on a tie rod, you could have as much as a half of an inch of, of toe change because of good tie rod ends. So the amount of play that is in the system is significant to the end result of toe. Here we have a three inch diameter bearing. <clears throat> that's, a, that's, a, um, that's a standard bearing. But over the 42 inch diameter of a tire, that means you have another 0.07 inches toe, possible toe change from a good bearing. Because uh, the allowable end play in a good bearing is 0.005 inches or uh, five thousandths of an inch. So you want, you want between one and five thousandths of an inch for a good bearing set. So the, the, the end result is the possible toe change is nearly one tenth of an inch or uh, 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 over a sixteenth of an inch. So how does this end up as toe? How can you take the, you know that it's floating out there. You know, there's a, uh, again, the kingpin has another 15 thousandths of possible end play or more or less, just depending on the, the manufacturer. So how does that result in toe change? Well, start with how end play affects toe. <clears throat> okay, the, the first issue is negative scrub radius. Negative scrub radius is the amount of footprint that is outside of the kingpin uh, inclination. 
if you know in the waiting room, good. There's the amount of scrub on the outside of the kingpin inclination. That uh, there's about two thirds of the tire on the outside of the, the kingpin inclination at the footprint than there is on the inside, which means that as the vehicle rolls forward, the the, the tire is trying to roll towards the ne the negative side of the of the scrub radius, the the side with the largest footprint. So if you are towed out. It's trying to go even further towards tow out. If you're towed in, it could be trying to get to zero, or it could end up at, at towed out, depending on how much play you've got. So how do we compensate for that? Well, the first and easiest way that we figured out, of course, is roll the vehicle forward. Let that negative scrub radius get included in your tow measurement. If you can do that, then your measurement is truer to the way it's going to be at 60 miles an hour on the highway. I mean, if we could measure it to 60 miles an hour on the highway, that would be great. But there's still no system for doing that. And I'm really not sure it would be, um, let's see, effective or, or practical for actually adjusting a vehicle. But the, there is kind of a way that we can tell what the tow is at 60 miles an hour. And that's that tire wear that we saw at the beginning of this. If you have feathered wear, then clearly the tire's alignment is not good at 60 miles an hour. We haven't, we just haven't completed it. So that's why, that's why we started with roll the vehicle forward. At another point, we realized we could just push the front side of the tires out. If you have to use turn plates, if you have a pit, if your guys wanna use it, then if you, if you have to take a measurement on a turn plate, and you want to include the scrub radius or the, the end play that results in tow in your measurement, then just use a spreader bar and push it apart. Now, now this is standard. Uh, is the, the whole idea was basically Mercedes, as far as I can tell, I think they're the first people to do it. And they, they still do it on all of their rear wheel drive vehicles for their cars. They, they do not do it on freight liners. I don't know exactly why, but uh, that's the, it's the their, their preferred method. And that for us, it's not as complete because we know that, that the scrub radius is important and we don't know exactly how much tension you would need to include or exclude if you're using the spreader bar. All right. All right, so are there any questions so far? Everybody's happy? Is there anybody new to this? All right, if I uh, got no comments, I will go ahead and continue on. All right. Okay, uh, moving on from here, we're going into, come on. And I may have to use my other clicker for a little bit, but moving on from here, we're going to drag versus thrust. Uh, this is the four forces that control alignment, things that I want you all to be familiar with, the uh, vocabulary that I would want you all to recognize. Okay. Uh, the first issue for the forces that control a vehicle, the, the things that we're trying to deal with are uh, drag and thrust. First is drag, which is represented basically by the steer axle. The steer axle has about 12,000 pounds on it. It's all dead weight. There's no power there. It doesn't have a, we typically don't have driving axles on our steer axles. Uh, so all that is is drag sitting at the front of the vehicle. And the rear end is where all the thrust is. Uh, the easiest representation uh, is, a, is a boat uh, riding on the water with an outboard motor on the back end of it. As the outboard motor pushes the, the keel forward, if it roll, if it's pushing it nice and straight, it's going to go over the water nice and smooth. If that is balanced, everything will be fine. If it's imbalanced at all, then it won't roll over, it won't uh, pass over the water smoothly. 
for instance, if it is off center, if you have one drive axle off center to the drag at the at the front of the vehicle, it's like a, a demonstration you can do is just pushing a piece of paper from uh, off center on one side on the uh, table in front of you. If you can see that, if you can do that, you can demonstrate for yourself what off center is doing. And what is it doing? Where is the drag going to go? Well, the drag goes the opposite direction of the off center thrust. Does everybody get that? Anybody, any questions there? All right, moving on. Similarly, if, a, if the drive axle is thrusting one direction or another, that's going to push the, the drag off of where it's supposed to be. Here you can see that the steer axle has to counter steer for thrust being off center. If, if the steer axle was still, still set straight, then the front of the vehicle would be going right, where the rear of the vehicle is going left. That's most easily demonstrated here with a counter steering forklift. The, you can see that the, the power of, the, of this vehicle, the rear steer, is pushing the vehicle to the left and the load will go to the right. Very easy for anybody to understand. If you don't have the drive axles straight, then the load will go the opposite direction. This is how that uh, tire wear is represented on the steers. As a uh, Again, you can have toe in wear on one side and toe out wear on the other side. It's going to be smooth in towards the frame on the right, smooth out from the frame on the left, and that's rear axle, right axle misalignment. Now we've got a third force to throw into this. And this is uh, the in America. I believe everybody here is a, a, an American on the. Uh... Have we got anybody? No. Okay, I believe everybody on the video here is American. Um, in America, we drive on the right side of the road. So all of our problems are right pole issues. We have worked in South Africa and a little bit in Australia. Um, not so much in England yet, but in, in all those cases, they drive on the left side of the road. And in all those cases we've worked with, all of their problems are left pole issues. They don't have right poles, they have left poles. And it's all because gravity is a significant force on your tires, not just a minor force. If you have the drag and the thrust balanced and the vehicle, the drive axle is pushing the steer axle forward, gravity will still cause feathering. It's enough of a force that if you just let the gravity of, of the road dictate the direction that the vehicle is traveling, it's going to cause feathering to the right. The same, this exact same drive axle feathering occurs if you let gravity push the vehicle to the right. So you have to counter that with the rear end. Now, where, which direction would you, would you push this rear end to counter that gravity? I hope everybody gets, it would be to the right. If you just point the rear drive axle so this a single drive axle to the right, just one 32nd inch shim off to the right, or one half inch shim in our MD alignment measurement system to the right, you will get that vehicle to drive straight down the road against gravity without using any additional forces. So uh, just as a demonstration here, where's the horsepower? There's no horsepower on the steer axle. There's 600 horsepower on the rear end. Where's the weight? There's, yes, 12, 13,000 pounds on the steer, but there's 34,000 pounds on the rear end. So which one's actually driving the vehicle? Well, it's the rear end. <clears throat> now, we have a fourth force. We went over drag, we went over thrust, and we went over gravity. The fourth force is scrub. <clears throat> scrub also works against uh, your tires or with your tires, depending on how you're doing this. You can see here that we call scrub the Dixie cup effect as far as it affects our tires. You can see that uh, if you have the wide side of tram on one side of the vehicle and the narrow side of tram on the other side of the vehicle, as the Dixie cup shows, the wide side travels toward the narrow side. So if at all you have the rear end set up so that the 
wide side of tram is on the left side of the vehicle. You will, it will be working with gravity push, to push the steer tires to the right and will adversely affect your tire length. But if you can set it up so that the tram is on the right side, the wide tram is on the right side, then the axle works, the two axles work with gravity or against gravity and with the truck to push the steer tires straight down the road. Now, the amount that we're talking about, of course, is one thirty second of an inch shim to the left on the front and to the right on the rear. If you can just get that balance done, just one thirty second inch shim to the left on the front, one thirty second of an inch shim to the right on the rear, you can get this vehicle to drive perfectly straight. Any questions there? Do we have anybody else in the waiting room? No, we do not. Uh, does everybody understand what we're talking about? Any questions? Do you, do you, are you all seeing me still? We got you, Kevin. All right, excellent. All right, we're going to go to the next uh, section. Is that two? That's two. Sure. Okay, next section. And why is this work? Okay, so that's your four dominant forces. You've got drag on the steer, thrust on the rear, gravity always pushing you off to the right. It doesn't matter how much of a light foot your customer thinks they have, they don't drive in the left nearly as much as they think they do. You, we set all these vehicles up to drive in the right lane. And finally, scrub, which helps push the steer axles up against the crown of the road just a little bit. The, the great thing about scrub, and I, I know you, you're, I hope you've all uh, been able to experience this yourselves and, and can understand how, how close and uh, fine-tuned this gets. A 30-second of an inch shim off to the right and a 30-second of an inch shim off to the left on the, between the two drive axles will get you what we see as uh, just over two seconds of straight driving. In other words, if you're in the right lane, in the middle of the lane, six miles an hour, no wind, nice straight road, you let go of the steering wheel uh, with it set up just that way, and it should go one, two, and finally the right tire reach, reaches the white line on the right side from the middle of the lane. But if you split it out apart further, to about three thirty seconds of an inch instead of two thirty seconds of an inch, and it'll be more like three to five seconds. If you split it apart further, make it about an inth, eighth of an inch wide between the drive axles, you'll get upwards of seven to 10 seconds. You can keep going and the scrub will keep pushing the steer axle further to the left until finally it's actually climbing the kind of the road instead of uh, drifting off to the right due to gravity. Now, between these steps, between about 10 seconds of straight travel and actually going over the hump of the road, you're starting to cause feathering to the left instead of uh, to the right or instead of zero feathering. So we, we really consider that as far as the driver's experience, we consider the between two and 10 seconds to be the sweet spot for perfect tire length. As long as it's more than two seconds in the middle of the lane, and less than 10 seconds in the middle of the lane, we're sure that we're not going to see feathering on the steer tires. So that's what we're aiming for. If, if that's what they experience, we can be sure that the alignment that we did got them the best tire line. All right. Uh, now, we wanted to go over this. The uh, issue here being right axle misalignment with tail app. Uh, this is how you get one steer tire wearing out twice as fast as the other. You know, I, I know we've we've seen, we should have seen this already. We should have gone over this enough. I hope we have, but uh, I'll just touch on it real quick. This is, this is the problem that we were having most dating back to the 70s. Uh, one tire would wear out twice as fast as the other. You'd have the vehicle aligned. Uh, the typical alignment would result in a right pole because of gravity and would result in toe out because the toe out 
the, the steering components had a little bit of play in them. So the measurement system always ended up with toe out and a right pull. But more recently, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, we've been seeing more of this outside right wear, toe in on the right side, and the left side is where nice and smooth. But it's still pulling to the right. Now we're going to go over a couple of the causes for this, and they go they they're due to specifications. Now here's the Freightliner specifications for a 2018-19 Cascadia. It dates back to before 2018-19. It dates to after 2018-19. It's all they're still doing it the same way. Uh, there's a couple notes here. I think uh, uh, just off this page are most important. Uh, it's that. Uh, first, it's recommending that you have four and a half degrees of caster. And that is a lot of caster. Dating back to the, uh, the manual steer days, we started with a half a degree of caster. That was enough on a manual steered vehicle because due to the steering geometry, you are picking up the vehicle as you're turning the steer tires. If you, as you increase caster, you're picking up the vehicle even more as you turn the steer tires. So when we went to manual steered vehicles, we needed two and a half degrees because power steering was so uh, was so powerful that it was hard to return to center if you only had a half degree of caster. So we increased caster to two and a half degrees to give it that sharp return to, to square that we needed uh, to get the vehicle to drive straight down the road. But more than two and a half degrees just results in more tire wear for a couple of reasons. We'll go over those in a, in a little bit. But first, note that their target is four and a half degrees of caster. And they're asking for a split of a minimum of, of one degree and no more than five degrees apart from each other side to side. And that's what the Freightliner is calling their specification for alignment. There's also uh, some, you know, the in degrees are asking for a thrust angle and scrub angle off of square plus or minus, and we'll get into how bad that is. But to start with, I want you to note that uh, in the lower right here, it says as a caution, this is every manufacturer has the same warning. And right now we're going to talk about the manufacturer's warnings as though they are. Uh, very, very important because they help us. Later, we're going to talk about manufacturers' warnings as not as important because they're not helping us. But in, the, in this case, as it says, caution, Dana Spicer expressly prohibits twisting of axle beam for caster adjustment or any other tracing uh, straightening purposes. Okay. And even torquing the torquing sequence of U-bolts can result in a different change in, uh, change in caster. But most importantly, they expressly prohibit twisting of the axle beam, even for caster. So from the start, the axle manufacturer and the truck manufacturer have a difference of opinion on what you should be doing with caster. But let's go into another issue here. It says that you need to have four and a half degrees of caster and a split of at least one degree, no more than five degrees. Now, how are you going to get a split of one degree? To start with that, the, that three and a half degree shim over there on the left side, on the top, is about what you need to get a one degree split in caster. Now, why is it that a one degree shim isn't giving you a one degree split in caster on your on your axle? Any, any takers on that? All right, everybody's quiet, so I'm just going to give you the answer. All right, the issue here is uh, the I-beam is a giant spring. Okay, it's the biggest, heaviest spring on the truck. Uh, it's the biggest, heaviest piece of metal on the truck. Um, but it isn't, it isn't a piece of sand. You can't just throw a, a, a degree shim on one side and expect it to, to simply sink right into the, the axle. It's a spring, and there happens to be a spring directly above it, or two or three, the parabolic springs that are, that are holding the truck up. Those have a lot more give in them in the first place than that I-beam does. They're a weaker spring. 
So instead of just twisting the axle, you're wrapping up your, your parabolic springs up above it. And then you're wrapping them up more on the right side than you are on the left side because that's where you added the shim. Now, if you wanted your five degrees of caster split, since it's about a one to four ratio for how much caster you add versus how much caster you get, and it's split you get, you almost need the stack on the right, a 20 degree split or a 20 degree physical shim to get a five degree physical split. That's um, uh, obviously untenable and ridiculous too. Why would they even seek five degrees worth of split across a I-beam? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, honestly, I still don't have an actual answer on it. So if anybody ever does get an answer on that, let me know. I'd be really excited to share that on the podcast or, or as an update on our, on our YouTube channel. But, but here's the, so that's what we're dealing with first is uh, in order to split caster, you have to add a really large shim to get it done. And that's what we're finding on the right side of Cascadia is one huge shim that is messing up the alignment, messing up uh, tire wear. Now let's go into how that works. You've split the caster. And now what, what splitting caster does uh, is, is, is it fools the steer axle into thinking that straight ahead is no longer straight ahead. There's actually a position just a little further off to the left that's actually straight ahead. And now without input from the steering wheel, the steer axle is trying to drive just a little further to the left. So it is, it, instead of having to steer it to the left, you, you hold it straight or you, you, you don't even have to really hold it much at all. And the vehicle will actually steer to the left for you. That's what splitting caster does. It doesn't create a whole new magical force that uh, counters the weight or the gravity or anything else. It just gives you a sense in the cab that the vehicle is driving straight, even though it's actually trying to go left a little bit. So what's opposing caster when you try to just twist it on the steer axle? Well, you've still got gravity. Gravity is still pushing the vehicle to the right. If you had everything else right, but you had let gravity push the vehicle to the right, if you, you had balanced the drag and the thrust, but gravity is still pushing the vehicle to the right, and you correct that by adding caster, you've still got enough force on the tires pushing it to the right to create feathering, okay? So if you allow the steer tires to feather, they're going to create a pull of their own. So the vehicle drives perfectly straight with this caster split for about 20,000 miles. And then the, the feathering has become a great enough force that it's actually becoming a pull of its own. And as it pulls the vehicle, well, you've got, you've got a, an alignment problem. So you're going to take it back to the shop and you can say, there's something wrong with my truck. It's, a, no, it's not driving straight. Well, it must have changed. It must be something you did. You must have done something wrong. They're going to go ahead and mess with the rear end. They're going to mess with the front end. They're going to do something to fix it, and then they're going to maybe rotate the tires and let you go. If you rotate the tires at that point, they're going to pull left for a little while. Then eventually they're going to pull right, and it's still going to go to the right because eventually, because you've not actually fixed the problem. And that, that comes here. You've still got the same weight issue. The rear end is actually driving the truck. You've still got the horsepower. The rear end really is pushing the truck down the road. If you haven't used the drive axles to guide the vehicle straight down the road, you're going to end up with a tire wear on your steer axles. So using caster to twist the axle to allow you to drive straight is just an illusion that is going to end up costing you tires and headaches with more alignment work. Now, if that, if that was your goal, if all you wanted to do was keep people coming back to get more money from them to fix an alignment problem that was really your fault in the first place. Good job, you did that. But if your goal was to solve the, the customer's problems with as few headaches as possible, with as little money as possible, so that they can actually profit off their track, you gotta do it our way. Any questions about that? All right. 
And I just need to mention this real quick. This uh, electric or electric over hydraulic steering, this new, you can see if this is the uh, Volvo or uh, Mac command uh, steering system, where you got this, this electric uh, gear on top of a hydraulic box, which is helping with inputs to steer the vehicle straight, even though there's a problem somewhere else in the vehicle or just to make it easier to steer. I really don't know what their, what their stated purpose is. I used to know, but uh, <clears throat> we're having the same problem with this because we've added a new input. Uh, you can have a terrible alignment problem with a vehicle, but that electric system is guiding you straight down the road. You don't feel it in your hands at all, but your tires are getting destroyed underneath you. So this is a, another, it's a new problem which is based on an old problem. If the, ve if the vehicle isn't aligned properly and you've got an input to the steering wheel telling you that it is, well, you're going to end up with messed up tires. All right, any questions on that? Any questions on anything? Is everybody happy with this? Is everybody asleep? <laughs> I just had to be quiet because Jason's got an air hammer going out there. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Let's move into the factory specifications versus empty alignment specifications. Um, all right. This, uh, this takes our the, the factory specifications that we were just talking about, the Freightliner specifications, and it uh, compares them to ours. As you can see on tow, uh, I was talking about uh, back here that we are seeing more toe in wear, especially on the right tire, uh, on the right side <clears throat> instead of the left now. And that's because of this. The new specifications for Freightliner's Cascadia allows from zero to three sixteenths of an inch toe in. That's their new specification. Our guide is one thirty second to three thirty seconds toe in. It's the, the green arrows there, the very narrow band between the, uh, the Freightliner spec toe. And now the issue, is, as you can guess, is if, you, if you're able to set it to 3 sixteenths of an inch toe in, well, you've compensated for the possibility that uh, as you roll forward, you're going to get toe out. But if you don't have toe out, if, you, if, you don't, if you've compensated too much, you're going to end up with toe in wear. So now we're seeing more uh right tires getting thrown away than left tires getting thrown. and here's a, another issue there their target is zero okay but they are allowing as much as 0.18 degrees or three inches of allowable thrust on the drive axle in either direction and that would be within spec now i I have one uh, common explanation or common uh, a, a great anecdote about factory spec, which might help explain this. And that's um, from about 10-ish years ago. Mike had this little Toyota Matrix. And he started wearing out the inside of the rear uh, left tire. Now, this, this was a front-wheel drive vehicle. It's basically a Corolla. So it's a front-wheel drive vehicle with a trailing axle. And it should just roll straight down the road. So that it was getting inside edge where it was a concern. He rotated it with the front uh, right steer tire. And the new tire in that same position was wearing on the inside left again. So he knew there was an alignment problem with this, what is typically a perfectly square trailing axle took it into Toyota, they measured it, and they found that, yes, indeed, it was off by a half of an inch. A half of an inch of toe out was on that little right or left rear uh, tire, that one position, the individual toe, a half inch toe out. But that was within spec. So apparently they, they knew they had a problem with production. And they knew that it was as much as a half of an inch of toe out in the rear. 
So that became the spec. And rather than fixing it, they just decided they would, the, they'll, they'll accept a half of an inch of uh, toe out. <clears throat> now, and I think that's the problem that Freightliner is having here. They would like zero to be their target, but they have problems with production great enough that they must allow as much as three inches out or three inches in uh, to be their, their range. Now, the, the place where this becomes iffier is that if you take their scrub angle spec, that is a, a spec on top of the thrust angle. In other words, just by you would get the thrust angle measurement done correctly. And then instead of measuring thrust angle again on the front drive axle, you're going to compare it as scrub to the rear drive axle. And you can add another 0.08 degrees of scrub <clears throat> to the thrust of the rear axle. So where we would measure three inches of thrust on the rear drive, we might measure four and a half inches of thrust on the front drive. So if you've got it off this much on the rear, you could have it off even further on the front. As, and as you can guess, this is just this is driving through a barn door sideways in our terms, as far as how far misaligned this is. But it's within spec. So that's uh, that's what we're fighting against. That's what we're we're trying to get um, fixed when we when we address these new cascadings. So as you can see, the green is our range. It's a fine fine little line. You can uh, easily fit it within the, the the black that they're using. All right, now this is the math. This is how that adds up. If you have a 16th of an inch of toe or a 16th of an inch shim of drive misalignment, that equals one inch of thrust from a uh, rear drive to the steer axle or 21 feet of thrust per mile or 40 miles of thrust uh, for every 10,000 miles. And that uh, I, th I think it's actually double that for the 16th of an inch of toe in, but we're going to say it's the same because the math is still really incredible. If you've got a 16th of an inch of toe in, that results in 21 feet of scrub on that poor steer tire every, um, every mile and 40 miles of scrub on that poor steer tire every 10,000 miles. <clears throat> so you compound those. You take your 3 16th of an inch toe in, which is actually an eighth of an inch more than optimal. You take your three inches of negative scrub which is again, three inches more than opt optimal. And you end up with 100 feet every mile that you're pushing your poor steer tires to the right or 200 miles every 10,000 miles that you're pushing your steer tires to the right using their spec, okay? So that's, that's the, 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 the dramatic um, <clears throat> verbalization of how bad your tire wear is when it is misaligned. We could eliminate hundreds of miles of scrub on these tires every 10,000 miles just by aligning it properly. And that, that difference there, that's a, uh, first that's how, uh, that's how the tires get worn out, right? But second, that's why Fuel consumption isn't actually that big of a deal on a, a, for alignment. You know, that's why we end up with not really a 1% improvement from the very worst alignment to the very best alignment. Because really, the only thing that you're getting out of a, a, an improved alignment is 200 miles less pushed to the right over every 10,000 10, miles. We're, we're talking about only 21 feet per mile difference in scrub. Of, of pushing a tire sideways. And it really doesn't take a lot of fuel to do that, which is why we never really see, we don't talk about fuel consumption. Uh, we don't talk about fuel economy. We only talk about tires because that's what's really being lost with misalignment. <clears throat> As you know, these are our specs. If everybody, everybody should already have these, if you need me to send you this chart, I can send it to you. Um, 1 16th plus or minus a 32nd inch toe. Uh, the caster should be two and a half to three and a half degrees. 
we want the steer axle square to the frame, we want the drive square, we want the rear inch as, as much as an inch to the right, the front inch, uh, front drive, rear drive as much as an inch to the right, front drive as much as an inch to the left. And that's um, uh, within one inch of each other. And that's, so that's the, the, the rules for drive axle alignment. The front drive must never aim right. The rear drive must never aim left. And on the lasers, we want to see about one inch between them. Everybody already know that? Everybody agree with that? Is this new to anybody? All right, well, I'll probably get some notes on this uh, after I'm, I'm going to try to get this on YouTube here today or tomorrow uh, so we can all enjoy it again. <clears throat> all right. Next relatively new problem is this uh, outside edge wear on the right steer that is caused but not by feathering. If you can see these tires, if you can get a close look at them, we chose these pictures specifically because you can tell that those tires aren't being pushed sideways. There's no feathering on the ribs. <clears throat> these, are, these are wearing nice and smooth in that respect, but the outside edge is getting cupped out. So this was, a, a, again, a new problem started uh, mid 2000s. So new to us in terms of that. I, I suppose if it started in the 70s and I was talking about it in the 90s, I, it would be hard to call it new, but I guess the older I get, the, the easier this comes. <clears throat> Either way, if this, is a, this issue is caused by an increase in steering radius, all right? So history lesson, going back to the 70s again, when we had manual steered vehicles, we only saw about a 17 degree turn in either direction. So that's why back then we had to make three turns just to get into a driveway because we just had no sharp turning at all. When we added power steering, we moved that uh, uh, amount, the amount of turning radius up to about 45 degrees, which uh, is about two full turns of a steering wheel. So the gearbox has about 19 to 20 degrees of turn within the gearbox. So you make two full turns, you get to about 40 to 45 degrees, somewhere you know you might go about one and a from uh, about two o'clock. So two full hours plus uh, 10 minutes to get to a full turn at that time. But recently, that has been increased. That was by, as you can uh, see, just by the space between the frame and the front of that tire uh, on the left side. That was the problem they were having. They couldn't turn the steer tire any closer to the frame because there were obstructions there. Well, they, they made the axle wider and they moved objects away from the frame as much as they could. Like, some of you might re recall that nightmare of a, a, a rack and pinion system that Freightliner used back in around 2009. That, that was to get objects away from the front of the frame, which is in this case, a steering gearbox and put it actually under the frame in the form of a, uh, a rack and pinion. <clears throat> now, because they can turn sharper now up to 55 degrees, that steering arm and that tie rod are becoming a straight line. And where you can see at 20 degrees, it's actually quite an angle. If you turn it to 55 degrees, and I should have had it on this presentation, but I didn't, I will try to get a picture of it for the YouTube video. Uh, if you look straight down at it now, when it's turned all the way out, it's a straight line. And the problem with that is that it has no mechanical advantage to hold the steer tire square. That right steer tire, that uh, Ackerman arm and tie rod assembly, that's the only thing holding that steer tire square. Okay. On the left side, you've got the steering arm coming from the, the, from the, the gearbox to the middle of the spindle. That's also holding it square. So we're not dealing, that's why we're not dealing with outside left tire wear issues, the same as we're dealing with outside right tire wear issues because of the, the way it's turning. What happens is as the vehicle turns to the right, all the way out to the right and backs up and now has negative caster, 
the steer tire has nothing, the left, the, the right steer tire specifically has nothing holding it steady. So it skips a little bit as it, uh, as it rolls. And that causes a cup, which as you drive forward, just gets worse and worse and worse. Now here is a, a little presentation. I got two different videos of how the, how loose the steer wheel becomes as you turn it. Hardly anything. And nothing. All right. Now that was good, but I like this one better. Uh, this is a newer one we did in St. Cloud uh, back in 2021. That's what I want to see. All right. <clears throat> All right. So, is there any questions about that? Everybody get that? Nobody piping up. Nobody ever needs to know no more. <clears throat> okay. The either way, the the, the fifty five degree wheel cut issue has um, uh, it it boggled us for a little while that we were seeing this outside edge wear, and there's still a lot of people that are experiencing it that don't know where it's coming from. Once you can show them that we've got this video on YouTube, and uh, I think we got the other one. <clears throat> Once you can show them what we're, what you're dealing with, they get to decide for themselves how they're going to solve it. <clears throat> We've got, let's see. Let's go ahead and share this again because I've got a couple things to help here. We've got, huh. Okay, we've got a couple guides and a couple of solutions. One is every turn of the steering wheel is about 20 degrees. So if you can turn the steering wheel two and a quarter to two and three quarters turn, we well, have that high angle wheel cut. Now, lately they've increased the wheel, the, the number of degrees per turn to uh, as much as 25 or more. So we don't know which TRW box you've got, uh just looking at it i don't know i don't know how to identify the change except that you can make uh, two full turns on it and you can turn it 55 degrees if you can see it physically and say okay that's obviously a high steer turn then you'll know that at two turns you've, you've gone that far but if it will turn further then clearly it's the old box with a high amount of uh wheel cut to it the, the correction to it is to adjust the wheel stop out. As you can see in that little yellow circle, the wheel stop is a, 
uh, a bolt with a square head. Don't use the one with the, the hex head. A bolt with a square head that meets an embossment. And once it meets the embossment, it's, uh, it, it stops. Now, if you turn the steel tire two full turns to the right, and you're at 40 degrees, and then you turn that out until it meets the embossment, you may need a new uh, you may need a new bolt. It may not be long enough, but it meets that embossment. Then, as the gearbox hits that, it'll get to the overflow, and it, it just won't turn any further. <clears throat> now, the, as we say, the left side does not require a correction because the drag link and steering gearbox stabilize the wheel. So, any questions about that section? The way this the way this turns out for fleets that we have worked with is um, if you're on the East Coast and you have been complaining about this tire wear and we finally get there to explain exactly what it is, you may determine that you've got such tight roads, such tight turning to do, such little spaces to work in, that there is no reason to change it. You're just going to enjoy the new steering radius and you're going to buy more tires because that's the cost of doing business. But if you're further out west and you don't have to turn that sharp in as many places and it's costing you money, then you've got a decision to make of whether or not you want to turn that out on your new trucks or on your old trucks or both. And that's the, that's the, the decision for the customer. It's not really our decision because it's performance of the vehicle. If you want to change that, then go ahead. Uh, it just means you, you're not going to turn as sharp, but you're going to see a better tire line. <clears throat> okay. Next, inflation. As we're about an hour into this, we've got about half left. Um, we might be done a little bit earlier. We'll see. <clears throat> okay. Inflation. This has been, again, I say it's a new problem. It's actually a 20 year old problem. Um, the last 10 years, it hasn't been as bad as it was in the, in the 2000 to 2010 era, but it's still pretty bad. As you can see, these are different variations of tire wear, like the, the upper left, probably a Goodyear, although there's a couple of different tires that do that, but definitely the Goodyear has this issue with like that ski mobile thing going on where the whole face of the tread uh, is wearing poorly. Um, but there's other cases where I think that's a Michelin in the middle or, or maybe a um, BF Goodrich where it's, it's just in the middle tread that you're seeing it. And definitely up on the upper right, that's a, another Michelin. That's what they call um, a high mileage wear. Michelin refers to that as high mileage wear. Everybody else refers to it as river wear. It's just a, a sort of a channel that runs between the two ribs. It never eats up an entire rib. So it's not like it's um, costing you money, but it does look ugly. And they have a new solution for that. I'll get into that in just a minute. Continental, you can see on the lower left, they, they get uh, a rough pattern. Um, what we don't have here, ah, it's in another one is the, uh, a single rib, the, the, uh, Second rib depression is what we called it. So out of five ribs, the second one in from either the left or the right, it doesn't matter. One rib will just completely disappear. And Bridgestone and Yokohama are, are really um, a problem with that. But all of these problems are inflation. It's not the, really the tire. It's the inflation that's causing these problems. It's just this is the way the tire reacts to under inflation. All right. <clears throat> a few questions. First, tires should be correctly inflated for the load that they're carrying. Yes or no? Any, any takers? I know the answer is, so I'll just go ahead and blurt it out. The answer is yes. Is it better to be overinflated or underinflated? Or it is better to be overinflated than underinflated. And yes, yes, it is. Overinflation is better than underinflation. <clears throat> and what is the significance of the pressure listed on the sidewall of the tire? For instance, on the tire that I have here in this classroom, it says max load 6,175 pounds, 
at 110 PSI cold inflation single. What's the significance of that? Is this the maximum pressure for the tire or is it the minimum inflation for the load specified on the tire? Well, it's the second. It's the minimum inflation for the load specified. You need 110 pounds in that tire to carry 6,175 pounds. We don't have maximum pressure. Or we have maximum load. These are working tires. Our, this whole industry, the commercial truck tire industry, is a is a working industry. It's not a show industry. Tire, car tires have a maximum pressure. They 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 don't really work. They're they're not really important tires. These are important tires. If these tires blow, there's uh, ninety thousand pounds worth of consequences. So your steer tire has to have. 110 pounds in it to carry your 6,175 pounds inflation. How much load is actually on your steer tires, on your tire and your individual tires? If you have a 12,000 pound steer, actually you've got 6,000 pounds for a steer tire. We kind of went over this earlier, but 34,000 pounds in a pair of drive tires for trailer tires equals 4,250 pounds per tire. The result, steer tires each carry 50% more weight than rear tires. All right, so does everybody get what that means? Uh, that means that all this time that we've been saying that you need 100 pounds in the steer and 100 pounds in the rear, we were overinflating our drive tires by nearly 50%, and we were underinflating our steer tires by as much as 20%. Does that sound rational? No, it does not. It is not. And uh, that's, that's terrible for the steer tire because it's working alone. It has to do all this steering, all this braking. Now we got, we got disc brakes. We're doing even more braking on our steer tires and we're, we're still not inflating them properly. They should have 120 or 130 pounds in them. You know, the, the, here's another chart. This one kind of talks about uh, speed range plus inflation. As you can see, if you are increasing your speed, you're getting upwards to 75 pounds, you should be increasing your inflation and decreasing the amount of load on those tires. So the faster it rolls, the less load it should have. The, the slower it rolls, you need to increase your pressure, but you can carry more load. And the thing to get away from this is, it never says take air out. It always says add air. It may say you can add load or take off load, but it never says decrease the air in your tires. It always says increase the air in your tires. <clears throat> All right. Um, does anybody have any questions about inflation? We can talk about inflation later. I think that's a, a topic that, um, although it's important, it is terribly important. Um, the, our shops here that we're talking to today, as long as your takeaway is at least put in enough air for the load, at least enough for the load, and more if you can squeeze it in. All right, the, but this is the tire ratio that, is, that actually becomes more important for us. That's the inside wear on duals and wide, wide base tires. Now, as you can see here, uh, on the left side of the, the screen, we've got the little, they um, call it the notorious washer with a square in it that identifies it as a Hendrickson. And you can see all the wear on the inside of that left, uh, of that, uh, you know, it's a left tire, um, both on the in, very inside, and you can see it's starting on the inside of the outside tire too. Over here, we've got uh, duels on a, you know, that's another trailer, it's wearing terribly. As you can see, there's a stack, just a stack of tires on a pallet, wearing poorly on the inside edge, all of them, every single one of them, <clears throat> stacks and stacks of tires wearing poorly. This has just been a, a problem ongoing for, well, since about 2005 again. So only about 20 years, really it's a very, very new problem. Um, this is our culprit. As you can see on the left side of the screen, you've got the, the Hendrickson LDA system, which stands for large diameter axis. And on the right side of the screen, we've got the older Hendrickson model, which is a, it's got a wider uh, swing arm. And you can see the edge of the, 
the the axle there it's a pipe it's a very thick pipe and it's u bolted into place on the lda system you can see that yes the swing arm's thinner and the axle is welded into the bracket into the uh into the suspension the difference there being the thinner axle of the LDA system, the large diameter system, is able to flex and so much and, and is so thin, they can't use U-bolts. So they had to the weld it in and it results in this tire wear. It flexes as it rolls down the road. We know it flexes. We've known they know it flexes. Everybody knows it flexes, but they're they're their largest customers um, around the country, and honestly, this design is copied around the world. Uh, they they just wanted to see a weight savings, and for any weight savings, they really don't care about tire wear. So if they're if you're hoping to make all of your money just on the twenty pounds that you could save per axle for having reduced the the diameter of the axle and the size of the suspension. If that matters to you more than you know saving money or getting the most out of your tires, then go with that system. If 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 the uh, the tire wear is important to you and you believe that you're gonna your company is going to earn its money based on excellence instead of mediocrity, then go with the older system, the older suspension with the uh, U-bolts holding the axle in place. You'll be happier. Trust me. All right, now here's supposedly the fix. I'm gonna to have to give a little um, update on this. <clears throat> now, as you can see, the, we, we have the uh, one and a half inch by one eighth inch thick angle iron across both the middle and the outside. Uh, first, we found that the across the middle isn't helping very much. If that's all we do, we don't see any improvement. If we do both the inside and the outside, we get improvement. If we only do the outside, we get improvement. So really we think we could probably do without the middle. But that's all the, the first most important thing. Second, only in some of our operations are we seeing a significant improvement by adding it to the outside. Specifically, uh, we have tanker fleets that are not experiencing any improvement based on adding it or not adding. It. So in their case, they definitely need thicker axles. I think the problem is that the flex is actually occurring right at that collar where it meets the suspension. So we can't weld it, we can't add strength to it uh, the way it's designed. Uh, we're just gonna have to end up with a thicker suspension or thicker axle or no improvement in tire life uh, depending on your operation. This can help. We think maybe adding the bracket to the top and bottom of the axle can help. But like I said, I think the axle flex is actually occurring right where it meets the suspension. So it may not be helping enough, not in all operations. Some places are, are very, very happy with it, but others just aren't seeing the, the, the improvement. And by the way, this voids the manufacturer's warranty. Um, the, the, the only problem is they don't buy tires and some of their axles uh, crack anyway. So I, I don't know what the warranty is doing for. All right. Next, very similar issue. Drive tires are seeing this wear also. Now, as you can see, it is on the left and on the right, we're seeing it on the inside edge of the inside dual. And that one on the right, the, it says it written on the front drive axle there, the M726EL. That's the first place I saw it. We would have an M726 on one tire, and it was wearing solid as a rock. We got an M726EL on another truck, and it's wearing, it's, it's seeing this copy on the inside edge. Every other time I've ever seen this, I would have said, that's a bearing. And in fact, that's what I told them at the time. I said, why aren't you guys tightening your bearings? You're seeing this inside edge where what's going on here? This is all we did, we, we got the bearings tightened, but uh, as you can see, uh, they, these are wearing where those are not. Now this isn't a tire problem per se, but it is the result of low rolling resistance tires. 
that M726EL is the extended life uh, Bridgestone M726. The M726 was not uh, uh, the low rolling resistance tire. It was a more solid tire. It wouldn't give you the same fuel economy. <clears throat> so the, the old 726 without the fuel economy was stiff enough to put up with the axle flex. The new 726EL was not. Now, as you can see in the middle picture, that's what I was kind of getting to here. The middle picture, I can't remember what model this is, but they stiffened up the outside edge and the wear just transferred to the next rib in. So the, the tire manufacturers see this as a challenge that they're trying to defeat. Uh, they're trying to make their tires better to handle the problem. It's just that it's not always working out for the best for them. This, this also affects super singles. As you can see, it's pretty bad on the left side, but on the right side, especially that upper picture, you can see that that's a um, it's a recap. And what we think is happening is that all this wear, all this extra heat occurring on the inside edge of these super singles is affecting the ability of the recap, uh, the, the, the carcass to accept a recap. And it's, so it's affecting their ability to get recapped. So it's a, it's a bigger problem than uh, just the tire wear. So the problem of cause is always loose wheel bearings. But if it wasn't loose wheel bearings, we figure it's axle flex. And when we say axle flex, what do we mean? Well, back in the 90s, they moved from a standard axle to, which was which is uh, not only 11 inches, 11 millimeters thick, to a new standard light axle of 9.5 millimeters thick. In the 90s, we didn't notice. We couldn't have told. They warned us. They said, we're switching to a 9.5 millimeter thick axle housing. And we just, uh, it just glazed right over us. We, we could not have told you that a change happened. Not at that time. Not until they started coming out with these 726EL tires. Then we started seeing all this axle flex. And are we really seeing axle flex? Well, I tell you what, we are. I just wanted to get into that um, to make it plain that the axle does flex. I don't know what size axle that was. It doesn't matter. The point is the axles are designed to flex under load. It's just how much flex are you getting and is it actually affecting your tire length? Well, I'm saying in the case of the 9.5 millimeter thick axle housing, yeah, you're seeing enough flex to affect your tire life. It's just obvious. It's happening all the time. Now, as um, uh, okay. as um, as we had pointed out earlier, uh, the I'm gonna, I have to go back to share. All right. I think I'm going to talk to you guys, and instead, I'm going to have to share this anyway. Be easier if you're all here. Oh well. We do what we can. As I was saying earlier, there are the problem, the, the one of the issues that we're having is the offsets, the wide base tires, the two inch offset specifically. If you made a two inch offset rim to a 9.5 millimeter thick axle housing, you end up with not just tire wear, but the possibility of cracking the axle. You should not make a two inch offset rim to a 9.5 millimeter thick axle housing. I think we can see that here. Right. 
9.5 millimeter thick actual housing. Um, at the bottom where it's circled, it says, uh, if you put on a two inch offset rim, consult actual manufacturers. Problem is you, you just can't make the two or you risk uh, cracking the axle housing. If you're gonna, if you have a two inch offset rim, if somebody has gone and done that on a vehicle that you're working on, suggest that they flip the wheel around. They'll have to stick the, uh, uh, they'll have to turn around the um, the valve stems, but if they just flip the wheel, the wheel around, they end up with a one inch inset instead of a two inch offset, and that should solve their problem with uh, with, with the weight distribution. All right. <clears throat> okay, so that was it. Um, that's the, the the things that I wanted to get out to everybody and make sure everybody understands. Uh, if, if you haven't been through our class recently, and I know some of our customers have had our equipment for as much as 10, 20 years and haven't been through the class since then. So I just wanted to make sure everybody got this update. Um, I'm going to suggest this update for everybody. I'm going to try to get all of the shops that are on our list to act to at least watch this video and maybe uh, go through a test. So that we can, so that we can know that everybody on the every one of our shops on the shop locator list knows how to fix the problems that we're sending to them. So we're, we've got, I guess, a, a bit of a problem with um, uh, some of our dealers, some of our shops, just having no idea what's going on, barely knowing how to measure a vehicle first. But then the third, uh, most important, not being able to solve the customer's problems. So if we, if we can just get a little bit of feedback on that, that'd be great. Um, I'm gonna, like I say, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I have a test to put together. I have this video now and I wanna get as many of our customers to get the, to watch this and, and understand this as possible. <clears throat> That's pretty much it. I'm gonna get this thing up on YouTube as quick as I can. I hope it works better than last time. I didn't do the subtitles this time, so it should. Um, anything else from anybody? Does anybody need to put something out there? Uh, got questions for me? Is everybody asleep? <laughs> All right. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. Hi, this is Rocky. Hey, uh, Rocky. What, what if what if me and Shanna fail, failed the test? I mean, we've only watched you do this live three times. But... <laughs> I'm not going to fail, Rocky. I'll leave that to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Because uh, if you do, I'll help you out in March. Uh, well, it's, a, it's an open out. book test, so everything should be <laughs> fine. And I'm not saying yeah. you can't take the test more than once. I'm just saying we need to uh, at least get everybody to say the right answers once. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Have a good day. You too. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, have a happy new year.